I've been asked a couple of times to put this presentation on YouTube, so here it is. The Illustrator Evolution of 3D Graphics Shading. Enjoy! My name is Pex Tillerson, I'm gonna guide you through this video showing you light. Some think God said, let there be light, while others have tried to describe it. These guys, thousands of years ago, described the laws of reflection, refraction, color illumination, binocular vision, diffraction and particle theory of light. The wonderful thing is, we now actually got the technology to compute light. What I'm gonna show you at all of these tables is the peak 3D graphics technology at different points in time. I'm going to go back to 1963 up until today. Starting in 1963, you got the Sketchpad software. You got computers huge, large as living rooms, having vacuum tubes and transistors. Still, you could actually do some real-time 3D graphics like this. You have the top front and side view of a cube, and you could rotate it in real time, as you can see in the upper right corner. Now, this is wireframe graphics. If you want to make solid objects, you need something like garage shading, described in academic papers in 1971 and used in 1972 by Ed Catmull and Fred Park. They used two computers, one being the file server and the other one being the display controller. They actually managed to do graphics like this. First, you start with a model. You take a model of a hand this time, uh, putting some triangles on it and some vertices on it, measuring them with a ruler and putting them in a computer program, producing a sequence like this. A computer animated hand spinning around and actually grasping something in 1972. This, this is awesome. Ed Catmull is now the CEO of Pixar Animation Studio and Walt Disney Pictures. In 1974, you got the Fong shading and then you got the bump mapping and environmental mapping, leading us to 1977 and Star Wars. This was the first time, or some of the first times, you actually saw 3D graphics in a major commercial movie. So, making a couple of lines and vertices, you could produce segments like this. This was one segment of the tunnel, and putting many of these together, you could get an animation sequence like this. And then, if you use that back projected behind the actors, you could actually get a 3D sequence like this, as seen in Star the first Star Wars movie. Now, that was a huge commercial success, maybe not due to the 3D graphics, but anyway. In 1980, you got ray tracing described, and in 1982, you got morphing described. And morphing was seen in, for instance, the Michael Jackson music video, Black and White. Going to the home computers, in 1983 you got the Commodore 64 doing something like 3D graphics. Uh, you're the elephant, by the way. You're supposed to tilt the iceberg to make sure that the humans stay on top of it. Now, it's something like th real time, and in a game like Crystal's Castle, you could get this, like you render a 3D scene. You don't really animate it because, well, you have a CPU that can't even do multiplications, but still a very playable game. In 1984, you got radiosity described. That's something that you do in real time in desktop GPU games today. And in 1985, you got motion capture used by Jim Henson of the Muppets. Leading us to 1987, this was the first time you got a home computer with dedicated hardware for graphics. You got lines, you got filling, which means you could do vectorized objects like this. And also games like this. This is Stunt Car Racer. Having some 10 frames per second frame rate, but still a very playable game. In 1988, shaders were introduced in the Renderman software by Pixar. And Pixar was a company behind the Toy Story movie in 1995. Now, this was a huge commercial success. That was the first time you actually earned some real cash from 3D graphics. The prototype looked like this in 1992. You used digitizer pens for moving the vertices around and making the models. And the animators used parameter-based animation like this, moving things around and syncing it up to the audio track that was re recorded before the animators started their work. Now, producing graphics like this, well, rendering time was four hours per frame, more or less, but producing a sequence like this, with today's standards, pretty simple graphics. You don't see much shading, you don't see much texturing, but still it's an awesome movie and it was the first time 3D graphics was a huge success in the movies. Which leads us to the next milestone, which is console graphics. We're going to the Nintendo 64. Still kind of primitive graphics. Well, you have textures, you can see the shadow under Mario. It's it's just a circle and the trees you see on the sides are just billboard trees that's 
while f always facing the camera, etc. But still a huge commercial success. I think mainly due to the controller being the analog stick, where you got the first way of moving around in a 3D environment easily. Now, on the PC side of gaming, you didn't have the analog stick. You had a mouse and a keyboard, which led to another genre of games like the MDK. So in 1997, you had software rendered games like this. The CPU were doing all the graphics, but still you can do a game like this. The hero is just, just a billboard sprite and animation, but the texturing and the lighting, well, static lighting that is, is rendered by the CPU. And you had 3D enemies, you had some physics simulations, and a, a fun game to play, really. Now, evolution led to the GPUs being introduced in 1998, or somewhere around that. We got the Quake 2 game in December 1997 using 3DFX cards like this. What you did get was the pixel pumping power of a GPU, well, the, the quality of the graphics didn't really improve. I mean, you got particles, you got lighting effects, you can see the circles when you throw this grenade right here, and the lighting effects from the explosions, but it didn't get prettier, it just got more pixels on the screen. But of course, we had the evolution of harder, faster, better, stronger PC graphics, but I'm actually going to ignore that. So in 2002, we got the cloth simulation, which is another milestone in Star Wars movies. And the next milestone I'm going to show you is actually 2005. This was one of the first mobile GPUs used in handheld consoles. This is a Nintendo DS. You could do some graphics like this. Of course there were limitations. You could only do like 2000 triangles in a certain frame. And the resolution was kind of low, but still you got loads of fun games to play. Leading us up until 2011, I'm going to show you graphics from movies and desktop GPUs and handheld GPUs. We're going to start with the movies. So we have the Transformers 3 and the graphics there is done by Industrial Light and Magic. And they got multiple light passes like this, ambient occlusion, normal mapping, texturing, well, specular lighting, etc. A couple of 20 light passes leading to sequences like this. Everything is shiny, you got some steam simulations going on, reflections, everything you could ask for, right, really, from a 3D scene. So, uh, what you do is you make a sky dome like this in a graphic scene. And a road, and a, well, a car, of course, and something going on. So you got this guy in the middle waving his arms on the blue screen, and you got loads of 3D graphics and debris tumbling around around him. Physics simulations for doing the collisions, and well, when you're kind of tired of making a scene like this, you just tuck him away, continue with your 3D graphics, and suddenly he's inside a car screaming. A slightly more complex scene, you got people tumbling down a tilted skyscraper filmed in a blue screen like this. You got loads of detail. Now, I mean, if you have the budget, of course, you're going to use it, and you do use it for something like this. Putting hundreds of layers of video effects on top of each other, you got sequences looking like this. Now, this sequence consists of a number of particles, things breaking apart, of course, and you construct your 3D scenes, something like this. You only construct the parts that you actually can see from the camera's point of view. So the sequence starts here, and what you have here is a number of simulations of fog and steam like this, and when you do a scene like this, you actually do the backside of the skyscraper, even though you're never going to see it, you use it for the physics simulation. And you get a huge number of effects and particles, everything turning around, something like this. But this is awesome 3D graphics, definitely. So, we leave the movies for now, and we go on to desktop GPU gaming, leading to games like this. In Skyrim, for instance, you are the hero, well, at the moment, uh, on a horse riding, but you get graphics like this. You get weather, you get trees, you get stones, you get cities, villages, stuff like that. Well, the best thing about Skyrim is probably not the graphics, uh, although it's great, it's not the the best graphics in class, but still the huge game environment letting you do almost anything you want makes this a great game. On the high-end side of gaming you got Battlefield 3 for instance with the Frostbite 2 engine that's made in Stockholm 
And what you see in this is much more detail. You got fog in the distance, simulations of everything, trees in the distance, tessellation, and so going to the handheld GPUs. This is a Timbuktu racing game running on an ARM Mali 400 mobile GPU. It uses 0.8 watts, which is way less than the desktop GPU you saw before, and well using nothing when you compare it to gaming, but still the handheld GPU experience is being compared to the desktop GPU games and consoles. So in 2012, let's take what we have learned back to 1983. So we're going to do ambient, diffuse and specular lighting on a couple of thousand triangles in real time on really old hardware. So you have the Commodore 64. It has a CPU that can't even do multiplications, but still you can do real time graphics looking like this. Well, it is cheating, of course. You have to be cheating when you're doing 3D graphics like this. So the normal maps are stored like an animation, more or less, and you do the character hardware in the Commodore 64 for mapping the normal into an intensity of a pixel. Well, you need to spend your time where it actually matters. Well, this show is over. I hope you had a fun time watching it. There's loads of links if you're interested to all the YouTube videos. I can recommend you, if you have two hours left, to see the Moleman film about the demo scene, The Art of the Algorithms. So, have a nice night.